Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to set up a new Windows PC for web development. In other words, I'm going to get WSL or Windows Subsystem for Linux. I'll get that set up, get it integrated with VS Code. I'll get Docker integrated with everything as well. And we'll create a super simple Express or Node.js app that connects to a MySQL database. Before we go any further, I do want to point out that you don't need to set things up this way. You don't need to use Windows Subsystem for Linux for everything like this. I just thought it would be something fun to experiment with, and I thought why not sort of document the steps that I take along the way. Having said that, this video is a bit different from most of my other videos. Uh, I left a lot of my mistakes in the final edit. So if you're looking for the fastest possible zero mistake guide on getting everything set up, this is not the video for you. But if you sort of like someone documenting their steps, you know, showing the parts where they got a little bit confused, so maybe you don't get confused there as well, then hopefully this video can be helpful. Anyways, let's jump into the action. Okay, so first I'm going to install Windows Subsystem for Linux. I believe the easiest way to do that is just open the start menu and search for PowerShell. And we don't just want to open it normally, we want to open it as an administrator. So you could either click run as administrator or just right click on it, choose. Cool, now we just want to run the following command. WSL space dash dash so two dashes install go ahead and press enter so just that one command is going to run through several processes and install basically everything we need so so far it's installed wsl it's installed the kernel now it's installing ubuntu by default i'm happy with that default choice for the distribution i'm not on the fastest wi-fi connection right now so this is going to take a little bit i'll resume the video once ubuntu has finished here I'm not sure why, but mine got stuck at 0.1%. I looked at Task Manager, and there's not even any data being sent over the network. So I'm going to try restarting this. So in the command line, I'll just press Control-C on the keyboard. Okay, I press Control-C a second time. That actually looks like it closed or canceled it. I'll run the clear command just to get rid of everything on the screen, and let me try it one more time. So WSL dash dash install. Hopefully the Ubuntu download doesn't get stuck this time. Oh, okay, maybe Ubuntu did finish downloading and the percentage number just wasn't getting updated. It never even moved past 0.1% and there was no sort of success message, but I'm just going to assume that it worked. And at this point, we just restart the computer. So let me restart and I'll resume the recording. Okay, I just restarted Windows. Let me open up PowerShell again. I don't think we need to run it as an admin now that we've already ran that command. Let's see, can we run WSL? Windows Subsystem for Linux has no installed distributions. Okay, I'm just following the official Microsoft instructions. So this is not off to a great start, but that's part of the fun of this video. You're kind of coming along on the journey with me, seeing what sort of issues and bumps in the road I run into. So the Microsoft documentation says you can just run this command and that should download Ubuntu. It didn't work, so let's try manually installing Ubuntu. I know you can do it through the Windows Store, but the Microsoft documentation says you can do it from the command line. So let's see if we can try something like this. Maybe wsl-install-d for the distribution, and then maybe just Ubuntu. Okay, it's actually downloading this time. It's not going to take that long, but I'll resume the video once this download actually finishes. Okay, so it got stuck at 37.5%. Not sure what's going on. I'm thinking that anytime I click anywhere on the PowerShell window, it somehow cancels the download. I've never seen anything like that on Mac or Linux before. I don't know if that's a thing or if it's just a coincidence. Um, I have no idea. I looked in Task Manager. There's not any data being sent or received. So let me cancel this, control C. I'll just try that exact same command again. WSL dash dash install dash D Ubuntu. Okay, I learned my lesson. Do not click anywhere on the window. <laughs> Somehow clicking anywhere on the window means cancel it. I'm literally gonna walk away from the computer until this gets to 100%. So I'll resume the recording if we get to that point. Okay, through the magic of not clicking anywhere on this screen, the download actually finished, and then it installed it, and then it launched this screen. So it's launching Ubuntu, it says that it's installing, it may take a few minutes. Cool, now we just pick a username. I'll choose Brad. And just to be clear, this does not need to match the username and password of your Windows account. 
This is for the new Ubuntu user account. Cool, so at this point, I think we're in Ubuntu. Let's see which directory we're in, cool. I think the first thing I'll do in Ubuntu is something completely pointless, uh, but this will help you impress your friends and family, make them think you're an elite Linux hacker. Let's install a package called Cmatrix just for the fun of it, right? Because you couldn't do this in Windows, but you can definitely do it in Linux. Let me clear the screen so we're back up at the top. First, let's make sure we're pulling the most recent packages. So sudo apt update, enter. Looks like I'm on a slow connection right now, so I'll edit this part out of the video, but your download should go fairly quickly. Okay, I'm not actually gonna bother upgrading any of the packages right now, but that should fetch the newest packages when I run an install command. Let me clear the screen. So now we just wanna say sudo apt install. The name of the package, again, this is just for fun. You don't need to do this. It's called C matrix. Cool, that installs super quick. Now we can just run the command C matrix. And now your friends and family will be convinced you are a super elite hacker. Okay, when you're done looking at that just for fun, you can press control C. Now let's actually do something useful. Let's get our Linux command line integrated into VS code. So I won't bore you with that, but right now let me just go download and install VS code. If you don't already have VS code, Visual Studio code, it's awesome, totally the industry standard, so I recommend you download and install it if you're following along with the video. So off camera, I downloaded and installed VS Code. This is a brand new, fresh installation. From this welcome screen, I'll just click mark all of these as done. I'll uncheck this show welcome page on startup. This is just personal preference. And now let's pretend we were actually gonna get some work done. So maybe I will create a new folder on my desktop and I'll name it example project. Okay, then I would open that in VS Code. So I would just drag that folder onto VS Code. Yes, I trust the authors. Cool. So now on the left hand side, we have the file explorer. So now from here, let's open our command line in VS Code, our terminal. So you can click view, and then terminal, or it's just control J on your keyboard to toggle it open and closed. Okay, so VS Code automatically points us towards that new folder project. Cool, however, this is using Windows PowerShell. We want VS Code to use our new Linux command line. All we need to do to set that up with your terminal open in VS Code is just click this little downward arrow to the right of the plus symbol, so right here. We'll just click that and choose Select Default Profile. And then from here, we're just going to choose this Ubuntu WSL option. So it takes a few seconds. Now, in my case, that didn't actually do anything immediately. Let's test it out though. So if we click the trash can to close that instance of the command line and then press control J to fire it up again, perfect. So now it's using our Linux command line. So we're using Ubuntu, but it's pointing towards that folder on our Windows desktop. Now to really prove to ourselves that we're using Linux or Ubuntu commands instead of Windows, let's try a command that doesn't exist in Windows. So we could say touch, that's how you create a new file in Mac or Linux, any Unix operating system. Let's say touch index.html. Run that, cool. It showed up on our Windows hard drive. You can create multiple files at once. You could say touch main.css and main.js. Awesome. Cool. Now there's nothing wrong with this default visual appearance of our command prompt here, but personally, just coming from a Mac environment, I really like oh my ZSH. If you've ever seen my tutorials before in the command line, it says just the name of the current folder you're in. So it would only say example project instead of this full address. And also it has Git integration. So you can very quickly see which branch you're currently working in and if there are unstaged changes, so on and so forth. So to set that up, we're already in the Ubuntu environment in our command line right here. So if you wanna set up oh my ZSH, the first step is to just have the ZSH shell. So we would just say sudo apt install ZSH. Let's go ahead and run that. Enter your password, it's very quick. Just say Y for yes, hit enter. Looks like it's a little under four megabytes, so should be a quick download. 
Okay, now that we have ZSH, we're ready to go get Oh My ZSH. So just go to Google and search for GitHub Oh My ZSH. Should be the first result from the official GitHub website. If you just scroll down a little bit, they will give you a command that will install Oh My ZSH. Cool, so just for basic installation, this first command, this curl method, this should work. So just select this entire bit of text here, highlight that, copy it into your clipboard, back in VS Code, within our Linux command line, just paste that in, and then press Enter. Should be a very quick installation, then it asks you, do you wanna change your default shell to ZSH? I'll say Y for yes, hit Enter, asks you for your password, Cool, and it's done. Let me run clear just so it's towards the top again. Cool, and that's what I was talking about. So now it only shows you the current folder name you're in, and it has Git integration. So let's turn this folder we're working on into a Git repository. What's cool is when we installed Ubuntu through WSL, it already has Git installed. So we don't even need to install Git within our Windows machine. We already have it inside of Linux. So we can just say Git init to turn this folder into a repo. Oh, we see that that absolutely did not work. Let me try relaunching VS Code. If it still doesn't work, I think we just need to install the extension for VS Code for WSL. Oh, well, this pop-up message makes the problem pretty clear. So git not found. Interesting because within our command line, you can run git dash dash version. Clearly git is installed, but I'm thinking it's some sort of integration issue with VS Code. So let's go ahead and install the official extension. So on the left-hand side under this extensions icon, I'll just search for WSL. I want the official package from Microsoft. So you can see this one has the check mark. It's from Microsoft. I trust it. So it's called Remote WSL. Let me go ahead and install that. Okay, now let me try closing VS Code and I'll open it up again. Still getting that same get not found message. I think we need to launch VS Code from WSL and then Git will be fully integrated. Let me show you what I have in mind. So I'll close this window and let's launch a new instance of PowerShell and just run the WSL command. Cool, so we're in Linux, but we've mounted the C drive of our Windows computer so what I want to do now is just sort of navigate to this folder on my desktop, right? Example project. So I'm in my Brad user home account. I would just CD into desktop. And then from here, I would just say code. So that's VS code. And then you give it a folder that you want to open. So I would just want to open this example project folder. So example dash project. It's going to take a minute or two just to install the VS code server. This is pretty cool though. It lets you launch your Windows copy of VS Code from within the Linux command line. So it's almost done. Trust the authors, I'm the one who created the folder. Cool, so it opened VS Code. It used that WSL extension and now we are fully integrated. But we can open up our command line, Control J. We've got our Linux command line. We can turn this folder into a Git repository. We just say Git init works like a charm. And this is what I was referring to. So now our command prompt, we just get the current folder. It tells us the branch that we have checked out. And this symbol means, hey, you have unstaged, you know, uncommitted changes, right? We created our three new files. So use the git command of, you know, git add dash uppercase A to stage everything. Or you can use VS code because it's fully integrated. So you can just provide a commit message. First commit, click this check mark. Click yes, I should have known before you can commit and get, you need to configure your username and email. So down in the command line, it's just git config dash dash global user dot name, wrap it in quotes. Cool, then do the same thing with your email. So git config dash dash global user dot email quotes test at localhost. You would enter your real email address, obviously. Okay, now we should be able to commit. So commit message, Click the check. Cool, so our command line is integrated with the git system in VS Code. So you can say git status. Cool, there are no changes. You can test this out though. If we make a quick change to index.html, 
maybe just add an unordered list, say, hello, hi. We save that. Cool, VS Code's like, hey, there's one uncommitted change. You can do it through VS Code, the GUI, or you can just go into the command line, run git status, say, oh, I have one change, and then just do it, you know, the command line way of handling git. So you can just commit all of your changes, git commit, provide a message, small HTML change, cool. See, I committed that through the command line. The VS Code interface knows, it's aware of that. I won't include it in this video, but if you wanted to now connect this to your GitHub account, well, you would just look up a tutorial for GitHub, how to add SSH key in Linux. And then you would just follow those steps right in this command line down here. Cool. At this point, before we move on to the next step and integrate Docker into our workflow, I first want to improve the way that we're launching or opening these folders in VS Code. Because at the moment, I don't want to have to open PowerShell and then type WSL. This just doesn't look super cool. It's not super fun. So let's use something a bit more modern. Let's use Windows Terminal. In Windows 11, Windows Terminal is included by default. In Windows 10, you need to go to the Windows Store and download it. So I'll just search for Store, Microsoft Store. Okay, from the store, just search for Windows Terminal. So this first main app choice, the Windows Terminal app. Yep, created by the Microsoft Corporation. Let's go ahead and click Git. Okay, that's a quick installation. Now you can click either Open here or you'll always be able to find it in your Start menu now. So Windows Terminal. Cool, so again, it's using PowerShell, but if we click this arrow right here, not only can you switch to Ubuntu, we can actually go into settings and tell Ubuntu to be our default. So let's go into settings. Default profile, just change that to Ubuntu. Let's click save in the bottom right corner. Okay, so now if you totally close this program and open it again, it will know to just use Ubuntu by default. Cool. So again, it's using Linux, but it mounted your C drive, the home folder on your Windows computer. Now next, and this is totally pointless, but you know, if you want to impress your friends and coworkers, why don't we make our Windows terminal screen a little bit see-through? To do that, you just click on this downward arrow, click settings. In the very bottom left-hand corner, you see open JSON file. So that's gonna open your Windows terminal configuration file in VS Code. Let's scroll down just a little bit. So for me, it's around line number 36. We see defaults. Inside these curly brackets, we can just say, quotes, use acrylic. You can see it's already trying to suggest it for me. Set that to true, comma, and then quotes, acrylic opacity. And why don't we set it to maybe 0.7? Give that a save. If you look back at your terminal, Cool, you can see it's a little bit transparent and you can tweak that setting to your liking. So if you want it to be a little bit more see-through, maybe drop it down to 0.6, give that a save. Cool. Okay, next, and this is totally personal preference, but what if you didn't wanna to have to manually navigate anywhere when you opened this up, right? So instead of having to navigate into the desktop and then to this folder, what if instead we just wanted a folder on our desktop or anywhere on our computer named projects and then it could have you know all 20 or 30 different folders that you're working on. And then you would just want your Linux command prompt to sort of open that folder by default. Well, let's do that. I'll actually drag my example project into the projects folder, but imagine the projects folder has you know 30 or 40 folders, all the different projects you're working on. So just to show an example, I'll create a few more folders in here. So example two and maybe third, project. Okay, so now we just want this projects folder to be the starting directory. So to set that up, you just go back into your Windows terminal, click this arrow, go into settings. In the left-hand menu, we see these different options, startup, interaction, appearance. Scroll down under profiles, click on Ubuntu. It's our default profile after all. And then let's just change this starting directory option here. So we can click the browse button. I'll just go to my desktop. This is the folder, right? The projects folder. Just click into there, click select folder. Cool, so that path looks like it makes sense. Let's click save in the bottom right corner. 
and then let me close terminal and reopen it. So let me open up Windows Terminal. Awesome. So now I'm in that folder. You know, you can run ls. There are your three projects. And now if you just type code for VS Code and then the name of the project you want to open. And there's even a tab completion. So for example, if I'm interested in this third project, you would just type T just start to type the word, then hit tab. It's going to auto complete it for you. Press enter. Yes, I trust these files. I'm the one who created them. Cool. And now VS Code opens to that exact folder with WSL and Git and everything perfectly integrated. At this point, let's change gears a little bit. And actually, before we go ahead and install Docker, let's get Node.js installed within Linux. That's right. Instead of installing Node, in Windows, we can install it in Ubuntu and then use it exactly like we would otherwise. Now you could install it directly from the command line, right? You could just say sudo apt install node or node.js, but that's going to get you a fairly outdated copy of node. Realistically, it wouldn't matter. You would get by just fine with the outdated copy of node, but just to play it safe to get a current copy of node for a Debian based distribution, Let's just visit the official Node.js website. We're not going to download for Windows. Instead, let's click Other Downloads. Scroll down a little bit. And I'm going to click this Installing Node.js via Package Manager. And then from this page, I'm interested in this Debian and Ubuntu-based Linux distributions. If you click that, it says Node.js binary distributions are available from Node Source. So I'm going to click that link. That takes me to this screen. If you scroll down just a little bit, I'm just looking for an install command that I can copy and paste. Yep, here we see installation instructions. So for the newest version of Node, Node version 17, it says using Ubuntu. I'm just gonna select these two commands into my clipboard, copy them back in the command line. You could do this in Windows Terminal or VS Code. Let's do it in Windows Terminal just for fun. So Control V to paste it in. Push enter, enter your Ubuntu password. Should be a fairly quick process. Okay, it actually did take a couple of minutes, so I edited that boring part out, uh, but now we have Node.js. Now, even though we didn't install it in Windows, we have it in Linux. So for example, when I just opened up my third project folder in VS Code, even though we don't have Node in Windows, we could run this command of npm init-y. It's gonna create a package.json file for us. And now we can start installing node packages. So we can say npm install express. It's gonna go fetch that package. Cool, and let's just set up a super quick express server. So in VS Code on the left-hand side, I'll create a new file. Let's name it, uh, you know, index or start, just a JS file, a JavaScript file. I'll name it index.js. Up at the top, we would require in express. So Let's name it const express equals require. The package name is express. Let's create an instance of that. So const, let's name it app equals a new instance of express. Let's tell it to start listening on port 3000. So app.listen on that port. Before that line, right above that app.listen line, let's set up a route for the home page. So app.git, if you just visit slash the home page, comma, Give it an arrow function with parameters of request, response, arrow symbol, curly brackets, and let's just say response.send. Just send over a tiny bit of HTML. So you can use backticks if you want. Let's say heading level one, hello, welcome. Helps if you spell welcome correctly. Let's give this a save and test it out. So in our command line, you would just run that file. So node index, you don't need the .js, but it doesn't hurt, but just node index, I'll allow that. Okay, and then in our web browser, if you just go up to the address bar, visit localhost colon 3000, there you have it. We don't even have node installed in Windows, but we do have it installed in Linux, and we're able to preview or you know actually visit it this easily. Now that we have Node.js taken care of, I think one of the final pieces of the web development puzzle would be to get Docker installed and running. So I'll press Control C to stop that express server from running. You don't need to. And let's go ahead and get Docker running so we can use it to maybe host a MySQL database locally or a 
MongoDB database locally, or if you wanted to run, you know, a PHP application, Python, or any language, basically any technology that you would want to use in your web development stack, you don't need to install it in Windows. You can keep your Windows installation super clean, super minimal, and just install everything through either Linux or Docker. So for example, in this video, I'll set up a MySQL database with you, and then we can practice connecting to it from our Node Express application here. So first, let's go get Docker installed though. So from Google, I'll search for Docker. Really, we're looking for the Docker desktop application. So from docker.com, see under products, we want Docker desktop. So here it is under features, Docker desktop. Click download for Windows. I'll edit this part out and I'll resume the video once I have it installed and opened. Okay, so I downloaded Docker, I opened the installation file, and this is perfect. The default option has this checkbox checked to install the required components for WSL2. This is excellent. So I'll just use the default options, click OK. Okay, it said the installation completed and it wanted me to log out before it could finish, so I did that. Logged back in, let's just accept the terms, click Accept. I do not wanna see tips. Let me skip the tutorial. So what we do now is go into the settings screen of Docker Desktop. In this left-hand menu, click on Resources. And then in the sub-menu, click on WSL Integration. So this option is checked, that's great, but it says you don't have any WSL2 distros. And even if we click Refresh, yep, we still don't have any. So even though our WSL is version two, we need to convert our Ubuntu from WSL1 to WSL2. For instructions on how to do that, we can just click this more info link right here. So what I do is I just scroll down until I start seeing command line text that I can read or copy and paste. Okay, so let me open my Windows terminal. Let me actually bookmark that to the taskbar. Okay, so to check the current version, you type wsl.exe dash l dash v. Okay, so you can see that yes, we do have version two for Docker and Docker desktop, but our Ubuntu is still running version one. So we want WSL2. So it looks like the command to do that is just this. So let me just copy this into my clipboard back here, paste that in. And then we just change the parentheses distro name to be Ubuntu. Press enter. Conversion is in progress, so it looks like this might take a minute or two. Process exited with code. Hmm, what if I press control C? Nope. If I just close this, open it up again and check the version. Nope, still version one. I'm wondering if the error has something to do with me being in Ubuntu here. Maybe I need to run that command from outside of Ubuntu. So let me open up PowerShell again. Oops, probably need to open it as an administrator. Okay, and now what if we paste that back in, change distro name to Ubuntu and now press enter. Like it's just gonna take a minute or two. Cool, conversion complete, so now we can close this. And now if we go back into the settings screen of Docker Desktop, you can click refresh or just navigate to this screen again. Perfect, so now we can enable integration for Ubuntu. So just slide that button to be enabled, click apply and restart in the bottom. Perfect, so now let me close the settings screen. Now we can use Docker commands from our Linux command line, even though Docker itself is actually running in Windows. Well, it's actually confusing because Windows is using WSL to power Docker. The lines are getting blurred, uh, but the, the point here is that our Docker desktop that we see here, this is now integrated even if we're in the terminal of Ubuntu. So at this point, let's do this. Remember this folder that I created in projects, third project, and we set up the express server. At this point, uh, let me reopen that up again and then we'll add a MySQL database and we'll host that database using Docker. I'll show you how to set up one example project and then with a little research, you should be able to do this for MongoDB, PHP, Redis, any technology that you wanna use. So let me open up terminal. I'll just type code, open up my third project. 
Okay, and this is how I like to use Docker. Over here on the left-hand side with our different files and folders, let's create a new file and name it docker-compose.yml. Okay, now how in the world do you know what you're supposed to include in this file? Well, if you Google for Docker Hub, so it's just hub.docker.com, and then if you search for whatever technology you're interested in, so if I want MySQL, Yes, I want this official image. It has over 1 billion downloads, you can see. If you click into that, scroll down. In the documentation, what I like to look for is a Docker Compose example. So you'll see example stack.yml for MySQL. So I would literally just select all of that code, copied into my clipboard. Back in VS Code, just paste that into our Docker Compose file. Let's make a couple of adjustments. So adminer is like PHP my admin. It'll be available in our web browser and it's going to be available on port 8080 in Windows. Well, let's add this ports option to MySQL itself so that we can connect to it from within Node.js. Technically, you could run Node inside of a Docker image itself. And in fact, if you were actually gonna publish this to a VPS host somewhere, that's what you would probably do. But we're just using Docker for a local development purpose. In other words, we can run Node.js locally. We really just want a MySQL database. So right about here, I would just say ports, colon, drop down, dash. Let's say port 3306, colon 3306. Okay, now this is just personal preference, but instead of keeping the actual data for our database in the container itself, I like to use volumes and create a folder in my actual project folder here. You can name it anything like data or DB. And then the Docker container will actually save its files. It's sort of like a shared folder between, you know, this traditional folder and the Docker container. I like doing this because then you'll just have this one self-contained folder that has your source code and your actual local database data. So imagine we want a folder over here called DB. What we would do after this ports line, just drop down, make sure you backspace out tab like that and we add another property called volumes colon drop down one space add a dash space and first we give it the folder on our system so it would be dot slash for the current folder we're in and then imagine we want it to be called db colon then you point towards the location in the docker container where the actual database data would be saved so this needs to be slash var slash lib slash mysql okay let's go ahead and give this a save and all we need to do to get things going is open up our terminal and just say docker compose up i'll edit out the time it takes to go download those images it's going to go download the mysql image the adminer image okay so off camera i just realized this is going to continually restart forever and it's never going to work so let me show you how to stop this task and then I'll explain what I just discovered in my research off camera. So just press control C, you might have to press it twice to fully stop the task. Then let's type docker compose down to completely get rid of what we just did. And in the left hand sidebar of VS code, you'll now have a DB folder. Let's delete that. So completely delete the DB. And now let me explain what the problem was. From what I've found, instead of keeping your project files on the Windows file system, it's actually a best practice to keep them in Linux itself. So right now, let me show you how we can move this projects folder into Linux. So open up your terminal, Windows terminal. Let's actually close VS Code because we're going to move this entire folder. So let me close that. And in our terminal, we're just going to move the projects folder from our Windows desktop into Linux itself. So for example, in terminal, if you type pwd to find the current folder or directory you're in you can see linux has mounted the c drive of windows right and then this is a windows path to your desktop folder projects however if you type cd tilde right and now press pwd this is the linux file system itself so slash home slash your name now if you run ls there's nothing in that folder currently so why don't we create a folder in there called projects? So in other words, how do we move this folder to live in the Linux location? 
First, let's create a folder named lowercase projects within this Linux native directory, right? So pwd, we're in slash home slash brad, just mkdir to create a folder, and let's name it lowercase projects. So now if you run a ls on your home folder, you can go in there, cd into projects, run a ls, it's empty. Perfect. So now we just want to move all of the contents, everything in this Windows projects folder into the Linux native lowercase projects folder. So to do that, I would just say sudo mv to move. First you spell out what you want to move, then you spell out where you want to move it to. So to begin, it would be slash mnt slash c slash users slash brad slash desktop slash projects slash asterisk. I want to move everything from this folder space. Where do I want to move it to? Well, just slash home slash brad slash projects. Go ahead and press enter type in your password. Cool, so it actually took a moment. It's probably all the node modules that took a while to move. But now on Windows, you can see the projects folder is empty. So now those files live within Linux. In the command line, if you type ls, cool, there are our three projects. Before we set up Docker, let's make a few adjustments. So let me close this terminal. So when we reopen terminal, we no longer want to point towards this empty projects folder on Windows. We now want to point towards a Linux native directory. To do that, we just adjust our Windows terminal settings. So click this arrow here, click on to settings. In the left-hand menu, click on Ubuntu under profiles. We need to adjust this starting directory. So completely erase it and let's type slash slash WSL dollar sign slash uppercase Ubuntu slash home slash Brad slash projects. I mean, you don't need to have it point towards that specific projects folder. This is just what I like to do. The point here is that this beginning portion, this is the syntax to point towards a Linux native directory instead of a C mounted from your Windows directory. Anyways, with this in place, let's click save in the bottom right corner. Let's close this out, relaunch the terminal to test it out. So when I relaunch terminal, cool, lowercase projects. If I type PWD to make sure where we are, cool. If I type LS, there are those three folders. Beautiful, cool. At this point, we can finally get back to the task at hand. So now Docker volumes should work flawlessly because we're working on a Linux native directory. So to get back into VS Code, I would just say code, third project, let's run that. Cool, let's open up our command line and just run Docker compose up. Press enter, so that's going to use our docker compose.yml file, only now it will actually work. There won't be any file permission errors and it can successfully sort of share this DB folder here with docker, with that docker container. You'll know it's ready when you no longer see a stream of new text continually appearing down here in the terminal, so it looks like mine is completed. So in our browser, let's go visit adminer, which is very similar to PHP my admin. So in a new tab, just visit localhost colon 8080. Cool. Okay, let's try to log in and then create a table in MySQL. Let's leave server as DB, our username is root, and our password is example. Try to log in. Cool, let's click create database. I know we're gonna move super quickly. This is not a tutorial about MySQL. Uh, let's just name this database maybe pets. Click save. Let's go create a table within that database. So create table. Let's name the table users. And let's give it two columns. So the first column will just be ID, type of integer, set that to auto increment. So we'll have that checked. So I have a second column called their name, set that to varcar, let's give it a length of 100, and that's all we need. Let's click save. Now let's just add maybe two or three pets. So I'll click new item. For the name, let's name the first pet meows a lot. Click save and insert next. Let's add another pet named barks a lot, and let's add a third pet called purrs loud. Cool, so now, in the left-hand sidebar, if you click on select users, if you click on users here, and then select data, here is our table, has three items in it. So now our goal is just to connect to this database from within our Node Express application, and that'll be a nice little proof of concept to end on. So back in VS Code, within our third project, 
Do this with me. Open up our index.js. Remember when we wrote this little bit of express code? Well, from within Node here, let's connect to our MySQL database. We actually need to go install the MySQL driver for Node. So in the command line, you could open up a second terminal, but let me show you what you can actually do. If you type control C, that's going to stop your Docker container. So it's no longer running. Okay, now instead of docker compose up, that's what you run the very first time when you're creating your containers. Now that our project already exists, we can just say docker compose start, and that will actually run in the background. In other words, you can still visit adminer, and we can still connect to our database, only our command line is free. So at this point, let's say npm install, the name of the package we want is mysql2. Okay, now up at the top of our node file, let's import that. So const, let's call it mysql equals, require in the mysql2 package. And I actually don't have the code memorized of how to connect. So just Google for npm mysql2. Let's visit the official npm page. If you scroll down about halfway, you see using promise wrapper. This is the syntax I like to use. So it looks like in these require parentheses, we would actually add on slash promise, just like this. From here now, let's just create an asynchronous function so we can use the await syntax. So maybe right about here, I would say async function. You can name it anything. I'll name it go. You can name it start or anything. And then right below the function definition, just immediately call it. But now inside this async function, we can use await. So let's say const, you can name the variable anything, I'll name it connection equals mysql. Look inside that package and there's a method. You can see Visual Studio Code already knows what we're looking for. It's called create connection. So we're gonna call that, we give it an object. I like to drop down one property per line. So let's give it a property of host. This would just be local host comma, let's drop down. Next, let's say port 3306, comma, property of user, this should be root, comma, property of password, this is example, comma. Finally, database and the value, we named it pets. Okay, now the whole idea is we have no idea how long it will take to create or establish that connection. Could take five milliseconds, could take 5,000 milliseconds. But right before this, where we say equals MySQL, so where my cursor is, if we just say await, well, JavaScript will wait until that actually finishes to run the next line of code. So let's just do this. Let's move our app.listen line that's down at the very bottom. Let's cut that into our clipboard and paste it so it lives below this line. Our Express app won't even really start listening or truly begin until we've established a database connection. Now let's do this. Right above our async function, let's create a variable and name it db. We don't even need to set it to anything. And then instead of creating a constant variable here, let's just get rid of const and we'll just modify the value of db to equal this. In other words, now we have sort of this global or universal variable called db that represents a connection to MySQL. So now here's what we can do. Down here in our route for when you visit the home page, we can run a MySQL query. So let's first turn this function into an async function so we can use await. So just the word async before these parentheses. Then in the body of the function, let's say const Let's destructure whatever MySQL is going to give back to us. We only want the first item from it because it gives you an array with two different things. It gives you the results and then it gives you information about that query. So we just want the first item in the array, which is the actual data. So let's call it uh, maybe users, right? Those three users from the database, purrs loud, meows a lot, barks a lot. So we'll set that to equal and then we just await db.execute. In these parentheses, just string of text, quotes, and now you can just write a SQL statement. So let's say select all columns from the users table. Now first, let's log that to our console just to make sure it's working. So right below that, console.log users. Okay, let's go ahead and save this file. 
Let's run our node application. So that's just node index.js. Now, when we actually go visit our homepage, remember that's localhost colon 3000. If we go check our console, perfect, there's that MySQL data. So now imagine we wanted to loop through that and on this web page actually, you know, show an unordered list with those three names. Well, we could just say, I mean, in reality, you'd want to use a template engine, but just for a quick and dirty solution, we could say, clear this out. So these are backticks, meaning in JavaScript, you can do something dynamic inside there. So before we get to anything dynamic, maybe just have an unordered list, right? But inside the unordered list, we'd want to loop through something. So inside of backticks, you can say dollar sign curly brackets. Let's start with that users array. So users, every array in JavaScript has access to the map method. Let's make up a parameter. Let's just call it animal. And then still in those parentheses, arrow symbol, and then another pair of backticks. And let's just have an HTML list item. Inside that, you'd have dollar sign curly brackets, and it would be animal.name. Okay, finally, at the very end of this parentheses here, before the closing curly brackets, but after the closing parentheses, let's say dot join, and then just join on nothing, just empty string of text. That way, JavaScript doesn't add the unnecessary comma in between each item. But big picture, if we save that and then restart our application, so control C, run it again, node index, go visit the browser, refresh, beautiful. And that's going to bring this video to a close. In review, we didn't need to install Git on Windows. We didn't need to install Node.js on Windows. We didn't need to install MySQL on Windows. So our Windows installation is still very clean, very minimal. Really all we installed was VS Code and Docker Desktop. Everything else lives within our copy of Ubuntu. From here, I encourage you to experiment with other Docker images. So from Docker Hub, instead of just MySQL, maybe you want to try out MongoDB or MariaDB or Postgres. Maybe you want a caching layer, so you use Redis. There are all sorts of cool packages on Docker, or I should say images on Docker, and you just pull the image. You don't need to install anything truly within Windows itself. When you want to stop your Docker images, you can just run the command docker compose stop. So you could press enter, but I want to let you know that that's the same thing as just going into the Docker desktop, you know, GUI application, and you can use this stop button here. So I just click stop. And then instead of clicking the start button, that's essentially what you're doing when you say docker compose start. Cool. So that's just a way of how to stop and start when you want to maybe free up some of your computer's resources. I realize we moved really quick at the end here because this was not a tutorial on JavaScript and Node.js. So if you want this code that you can just copy and paste and test out, I will include a link to a GitHub gist file. Anyways, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you feel like you learned something. Stay tuned for more web development tutorials.